gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to you Lord I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory When the darkness falls, it won't prevail Cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph yep. My God will never fail, no My God will never fail, come on I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. Every war he wages, he will win. I'm not backing down from any giant. Oh no, cause I know how this story ends. Yes, I know. I know how this story ends. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs. I'm gonna see a victory For the battle belongs to you, Lord You take You take what the enemy meant for evil And you turn it for good You turn it for good Oh, yes, you do You take what the enemy meant for evil And you turn it for good Turn it for good. Oh, you take, come on. You take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. Oh, yes, you do. You take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory For the battle belongs to you, Lord I'm gonna see a victory Come on! I'm gonna see a victory For the battle belongs to you, Lord I'm gonna see I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory For the battle belongs I'm gonna see a victory For the battle belongs to you, Lord You take You take what the enemy meant for evil And you turn it for good You turn it for good Oh, you take You take what the enemy meant for evil And you turn it for good you turn it for good I'm gonna see I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory For the battle belongs to you, Lord I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna 
you to take it for what you see but we know we don't have to do that because we're going to worship him and praise him through the battle right and we're going to wait and watch for him to turn it around for our good amen you may be going through something right now and you didn't get what you want are you going to give up No matter what the circumstances are, God will use what the enemy has meant for evil in your life and he will turn it for your good. I'm walking proof of that, amen. And that is scripture, you guys. This song is scripture. Sing it over your life today. You know, I haven't been able to talk this week. It's been quiet at my house. And you can take that for whatever you want. <laughs> and there's been times through it that, you know, when this is what God's called you to do for a living, you go, okay, Lord, I don't understand. But those times are the times when we get quiet before the Lord and we focus on his word and we declare his word over our life. And then when I come up here and stand before you, I believe that when I open my mouth, no weapon formed against me shall prosper ever. And the enemy's going to wish he never messed with me in Jesus' name. And you know what? You need to feel the same way. In the middle of the battle, say, devil, <laughs> you're going to wish you never messed with me because I'm going to press in harder. I'm going to sing louder. I'm going to praise him with everything that I got, whether it's quietly for the moment, it will get louder. You, Jesus. Your promises are yes and amen. And Father, I thank you that when we worship you and we praise your holy name, the enemy has to scatter. When we resist the devil, he has to flee. It's your word, God, and you will not go back on your word. everything in your life that you allow him to use. Everything. Nothing is wasted. Thank you, Jesus. Let's lift up the name of Jesus. You with me?
is filled with His glory, holy, holy, worthy of praise. Holy, holy, all the saints are singing His glory. You know, I'm learning every day. 
And I want the Holy Spirit to teach me to step out. And I made a statement this morning that, uh, um, you know, when you tell God that you're not going to do something, you can pretty much guarantee you're going to do it. (laughs) And I told everybody, you know, based on how I was feeling, you know, feelings are a liar. I said, well, we're not going to step out. I'm just going to do what we got to do and not, you know, do, take a chance on, you know. And when I said it, I thought, Holy Spirit, I'll do whatever you tell me to do. And I want you to know these moments of unsurety, these moments of uncomfortable, not knowing where we're going, these are going to happen more. And so my heart is, Lord, I want to do whatever you tell me to do, whether it sounds good or not, whether it feels good or not. I'm going to step out and I'm going to obey and I'm going to submit unto your word. And I'm going to believe for you to bring a new song out of me. And he wants to do that for all of us. Yeah, we have a set list. But I'm not bound to that set list. I just want you to know that old Scarlet was like, oh, don't get off course. Don't get off course. Where are you going? Where are you going? And my brother-in-law and my sister started teaching me years ago. I would, I would be mad by the time set was over because he didn't do anything we practiced. God wants us to have to lean on him. He wants us to depend on him for our next breath, for our next word. So I just want to prepare you that in this new season that we are declaring, this new season where revival is starting right here, this new season, God's going to put a new word in our mouth. He's going to put a new word in your mouth. And it's up to you to step out and say, I don't care what it sounds like. They're going to think I'm weird. They're going to think, God, please. No, it's not about me. It's about him. And if we stay sensitive to his voice and listen to the leading of the Holy Spirit, most of the time it's not going to feel comfortable. You're going to take a chance. And it's going to be taking a chance of being the weirdo in the room. Oh, well, I have been all my life, so this will just be normal. We have to stop feeling and caring about what everybody else thinks. If we want something new, we got to do something different, right? So get ready because I'm believing for the supernatural to happen in me and through me on this platform. I'm believing for the supernatural to happen in you and through you in the aisles and the altar. And I just want to say, if you get the urge to run up here to the altar, do it. Do it. And be surprised at what God does next. But he won't move until we move. That's right. So, here we go.
If you need healing in your body, I encourage you to step out now. Come down let people lay hands on you in the name of Jesus. Amen. There is a promise that points beyond my failure. There is a still voice to silence all my Jesus, the rock that never 
to him and what he does then is he now gives back to us in our 90 percent that it is blessed so lord we just thank you for that blessing that you're about to give us lord as we give unto you father we ask you to bless the giver and bless these gifts unto you the as you know we've got several ways to give we can give in the boxes we got the plates and you can text uh your giving to 73256 put in tfc forney and follow the prompts Thank you very much. First things first, I seek your will, not my own. Surrender all my wants to you. Keep the first thing first. To live your truth. Walk your ways, set my eyes, Lord, I fix my face on you, on my desires reverse, to keep the first thing first. All the things that I have held so dear, the vanities that whispered in my ear, what would I do if they all disappeared? What would I gain if my 
was so surprised I don't want to love what the world loves I don't want to chase what the world does I only want you I only want you First things first Good morning. morning. And welcome to Trinity Family Church. Who's glad to be here this morning? 
This is the day the Lord hath made. And be glad in it. Listen, we'd all be better off if we kept first things first. Huh? Amen. God is good. Can we have... And all the time? Can we have all the children, fifth grade and under, come up to the front? Yes, you get the lead this morning. All right. Come on. Well, the rest of them must already be back there. All right. Chewy, you ready? Lord, we just ask you to bless the children. Fill them fresh and anew with your Holy Spirit. Fill them fresh and new with your word this morning. Lord, we ask you to raise them up to be world changers. In Jesus' name. Patricia, I don't understand why you're not up here. I know that's right. That's what us dog lovers do. We chase dogs. Okay, make sure your cell phones are turned off or muted or vibrated, because if you don't, there's a 15-minute penalty. The preaching will last 15 minutes longer for each offense. Now, I really appreciate Scarlett's word this morning. That was good. Uh, we got to be the change that we want to see, right? We, uh, we, we just come out of three, in fact, I'm going to declare this morning the fast is over. So we just finished three weeks of prayer and fasting. And uh, it's my prayer that God has changed all of us through that three weeks. He's uh, instilled new things in us. And uh, we want to see that continue, right? Part of being a believer is that transformation process. In fact, the title of the message today is being transformed in the image of Christ. Amen. And so if we, if we want something different, we got to do something different. The de definition of insanity is keep doing the same thing over and over again and expect a different result. If you want a different result, you got to do something different. Amen. How many of y'all would be embarrassed to jump up and run, run around the church building? I'm not telling you to do that. I'm just saying you, we, the Holy Spirit has never asked me to do something that I was comfortable with. And I got a feeling he's not going to ask you to do something you're not comfortable with. The question is, are we going to obey or are we more concerned about what other people think of us? My guess is some of y'all have been moved by the Holy Spirit to run around in church, jump up and down, whatever. And you didn't do it because you were afraid of what somebody else might think. Listen, I'm a fool for Christ. Are you? We need to all be fools for Christ because that means we're going to be obedient. We're going to listen and we're going to do it. God doesn't tell you to do stuff that you understand. You understand it after you do it. When we move, he moves just like that. Amen. 
So I want to start off this morning by making some declarations. This has nothing to do with the message. This is a, a Dutch Sheets declaration that I really loved, and so I want, I want to declare it this morning. We decree that Satan's ability to devour and destroy America will no longer be successful. Amen. Listen, I want to tell you something this morning. There is power in your words. Amen. We know through Proverbs uh, that the tongue has the power of life and death. We are going to either speak things that agree with God's word or we're going to speak things that are contrary to God's word. And listen, it's easier done than you think. Uh, I think Scarlett mentioned this morning, you know, about, uh, I can't remember, it might have been before church. I can't remember if it was before church or during church. Uh, but, but the Holy Spirit will ask you to do things, and if you doubt and fear, it keeps you from doing it. Uh, and it's easy to say things that are not of faith without even realizing it. Because we've all been raised in this lost world, and we've heard things that sound right, and sometimes we repeat them, but they're not right. Yeah. If we're not speaking life, yeah. then we're speaking death. Yeah. And we need to purposely speak life. We need to purposely be encouraging people. Yeah. We need to purposely refuse to be offended. Yeah. How many of y'all can be offended this morning? Because if you can be, Satan will find a way, sometimes often through church people, to offend you. Yeah. Don't fall for it. It's a trick. It's the bait of, of Satan. He's trying to trick you into getting offended because if he gets you offended, he can, it's like having a noose in your nose. He can take you wherever he wants. Yeah. Don't let him. Refuse to be offended. Everybody say, refuse yeah. to be offended. Yeah. Amen. We speak to this door of access and command it to close. Yeah. We declare our faith in the mercy and the blood of Jesus yeah. that God has heard the repentance offered up by millions of believers yeah on behalf of America's sins and is healing our land right now. We decree that people in government and business will no longer feed our nation to the dragon through sins, compromise, and unholy alliances. We decree that their evil will be exposed, their funds will dry up, and their influence will end in Jesus' name. We close the door to their control. We decree that the evil pictured by Nero, violence, lust for power, tyranny, murder, persecution of the church, insane laws and edicts will no longer rule America. Amen. We close the door to the spiritual powers causing this destruction. Amen. We close the door to the destruction of our children, our families, our homes, our cities, and our nation. Yes. We speak to the door of promise the door of awakening and transformation of nations and command you to open in Jesus' name. We call for revival, refreshing, remodeling, and reformation into America and the world. We prophesy to the wind of God, blow on the dry bones of America and the world. Reconnect our scattered bones, breathe life into us, and make us a great army. Salvation, healing, purpose, and destiny are in the wind. Amen. We decree its release right now in Jesus' name. Amen. There is power in the tongue. Speak life. Speak promise. Speak encouragement. Amen? Amen. All right, so we, we have finished three weeks of prayer and fasting. What have you learned? What has God taught you? What has God spoken to you? What has God developed in you in these three weeks? Now, keep in mind, three weeks, at the end of three weeks of prayer and fasting, three weeks is a short period of time. At the beginning of three weeks of prayer and fasting, three weeks seems like eternity. <laughs> but whatever God is doing, has done in these three weeks, I believe it's things he wants to continue in us forever. Amen. We want to see the body of Christ transformed into the image of Christ. And, and we want to see every single member of the body transformed into the image of Christ, which means there are things you need to die to. There are things you need to live to. There are things you need to speak into your own life. There are things you need to rebuke in your own life. Come on. We want to be like Jesus. If we want to be like Jesus, we got to be willing to die. We got to be willing to take up our cross and follow Jesus. Are you ready? 
The Bible says in John 10, 10, that Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Most of the time, this starts in our mind. Uh, Tom said something this morning at the front door about uh, somebody called him. He was kind of expecting to call him. He was kind of expecting it to be negative. And he said when he answered the phone, it was the most pleasant conversation, totally opposite of what he expected. And he said that's the way Satan works. He wants you to think negatively before something even happens so that you can't receive the blessing when it comes. Uh, and so we have to learn how to fight Satan in our mind. I'm always saying you got to have three conversations every single day. You need to have a conversation with God. That's called prayer. Sometimes, or every day, you need to have a conversation with yourself because you're not always going to be in church surrounded by believers who are going to encourage you. Sometimes you've got to learn how to encourage yourself. And the third conversation you need to have every day is you need to have a conversation with the enemy. You need to do exactly what Jesus did in John chapter 4 when he went out into the desert to be tempted by the devil for three days. What did he do with every temptation? He rebuked it with scripture. He, set, he put Satan in his place. Because Satan knows scripture too, and he will take it and twist it and turn it to try to get you to believe something that's not in there. And the only way to combat that is for you to know scripture well enough, like Jesus did, to turn around and speak the truth back to Satan and put him in his place. I'm not buying that. You're not going to get me negative. You're not going to get me down. You're not going to get me uh, receiving the thoughts of the world or whatever. I'm going to speak the truth in love all the time. I'm going to think the truth in love all the time. Can I get an amen? amen? That's why we have to follow the scripture that states, I have to renew my mind in Christ every day. Amen. You do that by the washing of the word primarily. The more you read, the more you receive, the more you apply, the more you start thinking biblically. The more you think biblically, the more you're going to live biblically. Can I get an amen? Uh, Pat's been teaching on Wednesday night out of Romans chapter 12. I think she's been doing it for about six months and she's done three verses. And the reason for that is Romans, the whole book of Romans is the best theological book in the Bible. Paul just lays out his theology in the book of Romans. And Romans chapter 12 is probably my favorite chapter in the Bible because it is so full of, of transformation information that we need to apply to our lives so that we can be transformed into the image of Christ. Amen. So Romans chapter 12, 1 verse 2 says this. Paul said, therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy. Listen, everything's about God's mercy. We are terrible. We were born terrible. We have lived terrible. Hopefully we are being transformed and getting better and better. Uh, but we need, we have always needed God's mercy. Did you know God's mercy was on your life before salvation? You would have never got to the place of salvation if it hadn't been for God's mercy. So I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices. Now, it's easy to read over that, but what does that mean? Listen, our whole life should be a living sacrifice to God. There, with a sacrifice, there should be some dying, right? Right? All those old things should be dying, and all the new things that are ours in Christ should be coming to life. So we offer our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. Listen, this is our spiritual act of worship. Worship is more than what you do on Sunday mornings in church. That's corporate worship, and it's great, and it's beautiful, and it's especially beautiful because Scarlet leads us. Doesn't she have the voice of an angel? I can't wait to hear that new song just burst out of you. I started to tell you this morning, if you would throw away your, um, well, the, the sheet that she pulled, what do you call that? Set sheet, right? If you throw yours away, I'll throw my notes away, and we'll just see what God does. Listen, living as a living sacrifice and living a holy and pleasing life to God is our spiritual act of worship. Your worship is more important to God what you do Monday through Saturday than what it is even on Sunday morning in church. Your job should be an act of worship. Can I get an amen? amen. And verse 2 says, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed. How do we get transformed? By the renewing of our mind. He said, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. There's another scripture that I don't have down here this morning, but it, it says we bring 
every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Amen. We have to purposely renew our mind. Your, your mind is not going to renew itself. How many of y'all understand God gave you a free will? You are free to choose him and you are free to reject him. But by the way, there are consequences to all your choices. You want to live a blessed life? Submit yourself to God. Let him have his way in you. Let him change you and mold you and make you more like Jesus. And you do that every day through the frustrations of life. Like when your dog decides to run off on Sunday morning right before you're supposed to leave for church. That, that is a, that's a test. How are you going to handle that test? Listen, we all get tests. I heard one guy said uh, he knew he was being tested by God. And he, he said, I looked up at God and said, God, you know I'm a C student, right? <laughs> but the good thing about God is God is going to give you tests, but he's going to give you redos too. In fact, you get to take the test until you pass it. Ever how long that takes. And I, it doesn't take that long if you submit yourself to the will of God. Yeah. Testing takes time when you keep refusing to listen to the Holy Spirit. When you, when you refuse to study the word and apply it to your life, that's when you get multiple tests. Amen? Amen. Paul said in Galatians 2.20, he said, It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. I hope after this three weeks that you can say that too this morning, if you couldn't say it before, that you're learning that it's all about Jesus, it's not about me. And you can say, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Amen. Martin Luther was the great Reformation man in the early 1600s, and he said, if anybody ever comes knocking on my heart and said, who's in there, I'm going to say, it's not Martin Luther, it's Jesus Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Can I get an amen? amen. 2 Corinthians 3.18 uh, says, And we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory, we're being what? We're being transformed into his likeness with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. If you're born again and you've been filled with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit lives inside of you, every day you ought to be being transformed more and more into the image of Jesus. Amen. And when I say image of Jesus, I'm not talking about the way he looks. I'm talking about his character, his integrity, the things that make up who he is. And by the way, that's what makes up who you are. I don't care how pretty you are, or how good looking you are, that's not who you are. Now, a lot of people put their identity in their looks. But if you, if you do, you got it misplaced. Your identity as a believer should be in Jesus Christ, Amen. not in your looks. I don't care if you're good looking or if you're ugly. There's no ugly in here, but, you know, if there was, I wouldn't care. Right? It's not about your looks. It's about the reflection of God in your life. Amen. Have you ever heard me tell the story about how they, how they refine silver, how a silversmith refines silver? You know, he, he heats it up, and he, and he takes off the drop, until he sees a perfect reflection of himself. That's when he knows the silver's ready. That's exactly the way God does with us. He is looking for his reflection in us when he sees us. Can I get an amen? amen. Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Now, this competes with Romans chapter 12 for my favorite passage in Scripture. Romans chapter 5. Verse 1, therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So how do we get peace? By getting right with Christ, by submitting ourselves to him. Through whom, through, talking about Jesus, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Everybody say rejoice. Now do it again with a smile on your face. Rejoice. Not only so, now keep smiling because you ain't going to want to, but keep smiling. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces what? Listen, you can't go through life and expect everything to be rosy. If it is, you'll never grow. You'll just be content with your blessed life. 
God doesn't want us to be content. He wants us to be blessed, but he doesn't want us to be content. We rejoice in our suffering because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Listen, if you've heard one thing through me over the years, it's that the Christian life requires perseverance. If you get stumped every time somebody looks at you wrong or says something you don't like, you ain't never going to go anywhere in your walk with the Lord. You're going to be stymied by the enemy who has come in and killed, stolen, and destroyed you. So we, we know that suffering produces perseverance. So when you're going through suffering, you ought to praise God because he's producing fruit in you. That suffering is going to produce perseverance. Perseverance is going to produce character. Character is going to produce hope. And hope doesn't disappoint us, right? Uh, because God has poured his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. You see, at just the right time, when we were all still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Listen, Christ didn't wait for you to get your life cleaned up before he moved in. Number one, that's impossible. You can't clean up your life. Have you ever heard somebody say, you know, I'm going to come to church. I'm going to get my life right with God. I'm just not ready yet. That's dangerous. You don't know when your last day is. Every day we're hearing of young athletes who are having heart attacks at 25 and dying. I mean, you don't, you don't know when your day is. Jesus knows the day yours is, but we don't know what it is. We need to be ready now. Don't put off what you can't do anyway. If you're waiting to clean up your life, you will never do it. The, the way salvation works is Jesus comes in and he cleans up your life. Every change that you've seen in my life, and every, if you're a believer, every change that you've seen in your life, it has happened after Jesus came in. Amen. Jesus does the cleaning. Yes. Pastor Bobby, Jesus is a great fisherman. He's a fisherman of men, and he cleans them just like you do your fish. But you don't do it till after you catch them. You can't clean a fish you don't have. Hello. Pastor Bobby can tell you all you want to know about cleaning fish. But Pastor Bobby, the fish can't clean itself. Pastor Bobby cleans the fish. Jesus cleans us after he comes in, after he owns us, after we've received him as Lord and Savior. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 says this, May the Lord direct your hearts into God's love and Christ's perseverance. There's that word again. May the Lord direct your hearts into God's love and Christ's perseverance. Did Jesus have perseverance? Give me an example of Jesus' perseverance. He went to the cross. There's no greater example than that. But even just coming into, into earth as a man, he had to give up all of his glory. He had to give up all of his, uh, huh? Yeah. Well, I don't know. He didn't, I don't think he gave up his deity because he, he was 100% man. He was 100% God. But he did have to give up all that glory and power and honor that he was, was already bestowed about him before creation. It's a huge step. Would you be willing to do that? Would you be able to give up everything to come into earth and have nothing? To be a man? knowing Him knowing what a man was? But he did it so that he could save us. He gave up everything to come as a man that he could save our souls. And then the perfect example is when he finished his life, he purposely went, I want to tell you something. You, you can read the Bible and you can think they killed Jesus. I want to tell you something. They didn't kill Jesus. Jesus willingly gave his life so that we could have life. Yeah. All right. How many of y'all got your steel-toed boots on this morning? Pastor Tom, you got your steel-toed boots on? Galatians chapter 5, <laughs> verse 22. This is what living the life should produce in you. When you get born again and you, you begin to die to self and you begin to walk in life, 
you begin to be transformed more and more like Jesus, this is what that produces in your life. And so this is a great gauge for us to, to realize where we're at in our walk. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. Are you full of love? Can people see the love of God in you? Let me ask you another question. Because this, this very well could happen in the near future. If God doesn't move and things keep heading the way they're heading right now, this very well could happen. If you were arrested for being a Christian, is there enough evidence to prove you guilty? I'm telling you, in America, we got churches full of people who cannot prove by their lifestyle that they're Christians. Because you look just like the world. You act like the world. You chase the world. You do what the world does. We don't, we don't want to live that way. Amen. We want what God wants. We want to live like God wants us to live. We want to glorify God in everything we do, not just on church on Sunday morning. Everything we do all week long. Is your life full of love? Is your life full of joy? Listen, I'm sick and tired of telling y'all on Sunday morning somebody needs a smile. Y'all act like we are at a funeral when you come to church sometimes. This church doesn't do funerals like that. When we do funerals and it's a believer, it's a celebration, even a funeral. So if you don't have an excuse during a funeral, you certainly haven't got an excuse on Sunday morning during a worship service. The glory of God ought to be shining off your faces. You ought to have a smile on your face that nobody can wipe off. Because you've already refused to be offended, right? Somebody says something smart out to you, you just, glory to God. Thank you very much, sister. Thank you, thank you, thank you for speaking life to me. I needed it, I needed it. The glory of God resides in me and you couldn't wipe this smile off no matter what you said or did. Come on. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. How many of y'all got peace? How many, see here's the test of peace. Peace is, is, is not well gauged if everything's going well in your life. That's not necessarily peace. Peace, the peace of God is in your life when you can be going through hell and you still got peace. Amen. Come on. When the trials of life are attacking you, when, when, when the enemy is breathing down your neck and you still got peace, that's the peace of God. And that's the peace you want to live with. Don't let anybody steal your peace. Don't let the enemy. And see, that goes back to transforming your mind. What happens when things don't go right? What, what happens when things don't go as you expect it? Are you still going to walk in peace or are you going to walk in doubt and fear? Because the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, and peace. Oh, y'all don't want me to talk about this next one. Patience. You got patience? Because, see, that's what God's doing in you. When, when he's transforming you, he's putting his love in you. He's putting his joy in you. Uh, in fact, Jesus said, I came that you may have joy, that you may have peace. It's his peace. I mean, most of the New Testament, Jesus is talking about love, joy, and peace. And when he's not talking about love, joy, and peace, he starts talking about things like patience. Patience is a virtue. Patience is a, is a fruit of the Spirit. So if you, don't have, if you catch yourself not having patience, that means you're not where you want to be in your walk with God. You have not developed to the place to where love, joy, peace, and patience rule in your life. And we want to be there. And you can be there, but you got to die. you got to die to all that stuff that steals your patience. Mila used to say something about my, my patience every once in a while when we were younger, and I'd say, I have the patience of Job. Remember all the things that Job went through? He endured. He recognized that the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. See, most American Christians, we, we can bless the Lord when things are going good. But when you're taking everything away, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not blessing you. Are we going to be New Testament Christians or not? Are we going to be fleshy, earthly Americans? We got to reject that. We got to reject the world. We got to reject the way the world thinks. We got to reject the things that the world is pushing. 
We receive what God is giving. God is giving love, joy, peace, and patience. How about this one, kindness? If you think back in your life, the times that you have been offended, the times before you heard me preach and you didn't know it was a deal to refuse to be offended, what stole, what caused it? Usually it's somebody being unkind. You know, Ronnie, your hair don't look right. You know, it's all split and curl. You know, have you got? A, do you own a brush? You know, can you can you comb your hair? I can say that to Ronnie because my hair looks just like me. What is that? Was that necessary? No. In fact, it was the opposite of necessary. What is necessary is to be kind to each other. If you're full of the Holy Ghost, not only do you have Lloyd, love, joy peace and patience, but you also, kindness is coming out of you. You couldn't say a bad word if you wanted to. If you're full of the Holy Ghost and you're, you're living that transformed life, you can't say stuff that's unkind. So if you can still say stuff that's unkind, there's a problem. Somebody needs to be refilled with the Holy Ghost. Somebody needs to continue in their transformation process. Amen? It doesn't cost you anything to be kind. You can think about something good in every person you meet. And I believe that. Now, there are some people that will test that. They're not in this church, but there are some people who would test that out in the world. But listen, no matter how bad they are, they're still made in the image of God. And we need to love them. And we've heard stories of people who were just absolutely horrible people who got touched by the power of God and changed. Actually went from being flesh monsters to being saints. It can happen. Transformation isn't just for the goody two-shoes. Transformation is for the worst of the worst, along with everybody else. Amen? And by the way, whether we know it or not, we all have been part of that worst of the worst. So, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, Listen, we sang about nearly every one of those this morning. We, we, that is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. It's a fruit of transformation taking place in your life. Amen. How about gentleness? Are you gentle? Are you gentle in your interactions with other people? Are you loud, bold, and proud? And I'm not sure this last one ain't the most important one. Self-control. One of the fruits of the Spirit is self-control. The more you are filled with the Holy Ghost, the more you are being transformed by the power of God working in your life, the more self-control you're going to have. And my guess is there's not a person in here this morning that can't be, use a little more self-control. Sometimes it's easy for me to keep my mouth shut. But I do find that there are times when it's hard to keep my mouth shut. Self-control. Learning to live by the Spirit. Learning to be obedient by the Spirit. He said, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature. Listen, anywhere you have a problem on this list, it's because in that area you have not crucified your flesh. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature and its passions and its desires. So when we talk about you got to die, what are you dying to? You're dying to yourself. You're dying to those uh, fleshy, natural desires that you're born with. You're dying to that, and you're learning to walk in the Spirit. Amen. How many of y'all want to be Spirit-led Christians? Yes. And then he goes on to say, since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. What's he saying? Walk in the Spirit. You have a choice every single day. You can either walk by the flesh or you can walk by the Spirit. I don't care how born again you are. I don't care how, well, I do care, because the more you're filled with the Holy Spirit, the less you are going to walk according to the flesh. You're going to be, your tendency is going to be to walk in the Spirit. But anytime you catch yourself not walking in the Spirit, then there's something, that's a red flag, there's something in your life that needs to change. There's more transformation that needs to take place. By the way, I don't know a living soul that has arrived. Every one of us are somewhere in that transformation process. 
And I don't care if you live to be 120. And by the way, I think it's okay to claim 120 because God said he'd give us 120. Uh, but even if you live to be 120, you are still going to be being transformed even 60 years from now. Listen, let me ask you a question. Did Moses arrive? You know, we look at him, we read that story, and we go, man, he's the most spiritual man that ever lived. And you can make a case for that. But, you know, he, he, he has seen God. He has walked with God. God has talked to him as a friend and put him in charge of these millions of people to lead them through the desert. And, and you know, there's, there's, there's some beautiful parts of that story. One is... Every time the people would fail and God would get mad and threaten to destroy him, what would Moses do? He would stop and intervene. God, don't destroy your people. This will make you look bad. All the nations across the world will hear you. And he starts speaking his own word back to him. And God relents. And then a little bit later, uh, the people keep doing the same thing. And God doesn't say nothing. But Moses gets mad. And instead of touching the rock, he strikes the rock out of anger. So even Moses, past the age of 80, walking with God, never completely arrived. And, and I want that to be a story for you to, to, to encourage you this morning. Listen, it doesn't matter where you're at. It matters where you're headed. I don't believe God is near concerned about where we're at. If we're, if, we're all, if we're not born again, of course he does. He wants to be born again. But once we're born again, it's not so much where you're at as it is where you're going. Don't let, listen, the enemy doesn't want you to grow. The enemy doesn't want you to listen to God. The enemy doesn't want you praying. The enemy doesn't want you in the Word. So when you, when you, when you let's say you set a time every day you're going to read the Word. Let me tell you what's going to happen every day when you do that. The enemy is going to do everything in his power to distract you, to discourage you, to make you feel tired, to make you feel like you don't want to read, to keep you away from the Word. Everything in his power. But you're the human. You're the one that makes the choices. The devil cannot make choices for you. All he can do is whisper in your ear, whisper lies, whisper deceit, and try to trick you. And if you fall for it, whose fault is it? It's yours. You allowed the enemy of your soul to trick you and deceive you into doing or not doing something you know you should do. But that's not God's will. God's will is for you to be obedient. And here's the, here's the thing. Satan... How many of y'all have heard the two voices? Surely everybody in this room, if you're born again, you've heard two voices. Because the way I tell a story, it's like the devil's in one ear, but he doesn't whisper. He kind of screams in my left ear. But the Holy Spirit is in my right ear, and he kind of <laughs> whispers. Uh, that, this is a really good clue for you. This is one of the ways where you, if, you, if you're struggling with, is it the devil or is it God, this is a good way to tell. The, the enemy shouts into your ear, and the Holy Spirit whispers. And God is not going to change his approach no matter how loud and boisterous our culture gets. It's still that small, still voice. And if we're going to hear it, we've got, we got to get small. We've got to get still. We've got to get quiet. We've got to get isolated where we can hear God's voice. You can't hear God's voice if you're in a room like this and like when y'all are greeting on Sunday mornings, you know, after the offering. You, you can't hear God's voice during that because you're hearing a hundred other voices whispering and some, some of y'all are loud. Huh? I'm looking. Who's loud? Somebody in here is loud. You got to get alone. You got to get quiet. You got to get still so you can hear. <clears throat> Colossians chapter 3 verse 5 says this. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. Did you get that? Man, scripture is so easy just to read over and go, oh, that sounded so good. Listen, God is telling us to put to death anything that belongs to our earthly nature. All those old ways got to go. All those old thoughts got to go. You got to kill them. That's part of taking up your cross and denying yourself and following Jesus. And then he lists some of them. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, greed, which is idolatry. Listen, these are all things that the world we live in right now is full of. You've got to purposely choose to die to those. Because if you don't, they're going to creep in. You're going to hear it everywhere you go. Right? You're going to see it. <clears throat> I think our government has probably always had corruption in it. But I, in my lifetime, I have never seen it to the degree that it is right now. It looks impossible for us to overcome how much corruption is in the world. 
And I'll tell you, it is impossible for us, but it is not impossible for God. I believe God is about to clean house. We just made that decree this morning. He is going to clean house. But he's not just going to clean house in our government. God wants to clean house in us. You know, judgment starts in the house of God. Uh, it's, it's hypocritical for us to pray against the corruption in government and us to be living double lives. Right? The, the real change starts with us first, and then it's going to go to the world. Can you give an amen? Colossians chapter 3, verse 9, a few verses down, he goes on to say, Do not lie to each other. Since you have take why? Since you have taken off your old self with its practices. You want change? You got to do something different. You got to quit doing all those things you've done all your life that just seem natural. Listen, anybody can lose their temper. Anybody can throw a fit. It don't take nothing special about that. I'll tell you where it takes something special is to be filled with the Holy Spirit and refuse to throw tantrum tantrums, yeah. refuse to get angry, refuse to respond to the flesh, and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge. We're back to Romans chapter 12 too. Being renewed in knowledge in, in the image of its creator. Jesus' whole goal for us, once you become a believer, he wants to make you more like him, and he wants to use you to further his kingdom. Now, who makes the best representatives for the kingdom of God here on earth? Huh? Do we? Not all of us, but we should be, right? We should be. We should be so <coughs> full of the Holy Spirit, so our lives should be so indicative of somebody who's taking up their cross, denying themselves, and killing their old man, that we reflect the glory of God in the world in which we live. First Corinthians chapter one, verse 10, he said, I appeal to you brothers in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another so that there may be no divisions among you and that you may be perfectly united in mind and thought. So what's the key to the church operating as Jesus wants us to? It's unity, right? Isn't that what he's saying? Be un make sure there's no divisions amongst you. We agree. It's hard for people who are walking in the flesh to agree with people who are walking in the Spirit. So we need a body of Christ that's full of God, full of the Holy Spirit, walking in His power and might, dying daily to self, and letting God have His way in us. He's transforming us every single day, making us more and more like Jesus. Amen? Yeah. I'm going to read uh, three more scriptures, and they're, they're, they're all very uh, related, and then I'm going to end with one quotation. Acts chapter 3, verse 19 says, Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. Listen, this was Jesus' ministry. Jesus started out, his first words was, Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And I'm telling you, just because you're born again doesn't mean you don't need to repent anymore. Every time you sin, you need to repent. And you need to be at a place where you can recognize sin. Because many of us don't even recognize it, right? We get mad. We holler and scream at somebody. Um, and it seems natural to us because we've done it all of our lives. That's not the way Christians should live anymore. A couple weeks ago, I told a story about I was playing golf, and I was, I was talking to the guys, and I, I said, you know, there's about 60 or 70 guys out there playing every Wednesday when we play. And, and, and I've been playing since June, and so I, I made the comment, I have not played with anybody out here that wasn't, a good person, you know, I mean, enjoy playing with them. And, that, and that's been my history with golf throughout the years. Some of the best people in the world play golf. Uh, it's, just, it's just that kind of sport. Uh, and so this guy, this, the guy said that to me. He said, well, I can tell you one guy out here you won't like. And he gave me his name. And I said, well, I must not have played with him yet. And he said, well, you ain't got, he said, I, I like the guy as a person, but I can't stand to play golf with him because he gets mad. He's angry all the time. He, he cusses. Uh, he said, he said, listen, I was in the Navy for 18 years. I've heard every cuss word imaginable to man. I just hadn't heard them all in one sentence till I listened to this guy. <laughs> and then he said, he's a Sunday school teacher at his church. Something wrong with that picture? 
Acts 2.38, which is just a few verses before that, would have Acts 3.19. Peter replied, remember when he's preaching? Peter replied, he said, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Matthew chapter 4, 17, when Jesus first begins, what's the first thing he says? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Listen, for us as believers and for the lost, it requires repentance to come to know God, but it also requires repentance for believers if we're going to walk the way God wants us to walk. Can I get an amen? And then this is my quote I want to end with. Uh, Charles Swindoll said this, he said, I know of no other single practice in the Christian life that's more rewarding, practically speaking, than memorizing Scripture. No other single exercise plays greater spiritual dividends. Your prayer life will be strengthened. Your witnessing will be sharper and much more effective. Your counseling will be in demand. Your attitudes, hello, your attitudes and your outlook will begin to change. Your mind will become alert and observant. Your confidence and assurance will be enhanced. Your faith will be solidified. And you say, well, that doesn't seem to have anything to do with the rest of your message. Listen, we got to get in the Word. And there's something about memorizing Scripture uh, that changes everything. I, I noticed in my own life when I started uh, memorizing, I kind of always have some, but when I got serious about memorizing Scripture, uh, everything changed. All my conversations were more winsome. Uh, my counseling changed. Because uh, it's like when somebody would speak, no matter what they brought up, it's like God would give me a scripture that I had read and memorized, and it's easy to, to speak back to them. It changes everything. You want to be happy in Jesus? Start memorizing scripture. Let it, the Holy Spirit can always bring back to your remembrance anything that you have studied. But if you've never read it, he can't bring it back to your remembrance because you don't know it. But if you know it, he can bring it back. And it's always there. You remember that place where he said, don't worry about what to say when you're arrested and put in prison? He said, the Holy Spirit will always give you the words to say. If you would, stand with me for just a moment. I kind of want today to be a little bit of a day of celebration. The fast is over. Somebody say... Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Uh, but I also want us to end well, and I want us to continue to go on well. We, we don't want to waste this three weeks of prayer and fasting. God is doing things in people's lives. I know from what I'm hearing back in, in reports coming back to me is that transformation is taking place. People's thinking is changing. Their actions are changing. They're actually dying to things. Uh, these are all great signs of a healthy church. Uh, but listen, we want to keep that going. We, we're not doing it for three weeks so we can do whatever we want to do the rest of the year. No. I'm telling you, the rest of the year, I believe for us, is going to be incredibly impactful. Many of us have no idea of things that God's doing through us, and we don't even know it. Don Babin will be here in February. Did you know his ministry averages about four to 5,000 souls a year? Every time we sow into that ministry, we are sowing into the kingdom. We, we are sowing into souls being saved. I'd love to see us lead four or 5,000 people to Christ this year. Wouldn't that be cool? But listen, it's not going to happen if you leave it up to me. I may not even meet 5,000 people this year. But you take a group of 100, we all reach a few, we can reach 5,000. But it takes the body doing the work, right? Uh, he's coming in February. That's going to be great. We're going to have a men's breakfast on uh, Saturday morning. We're going to go out soul winning on after the men's breakfast. So I'm going to encourage all the ladies to even come after the men's breakfast. In fact, you can come during the men's breakfast. If you want some good bacon, egg, and sausage, then you come too. And then we'll all go out and we'll go soul winning. Uh, in March... We've got Dr. Buddy Bell coming, and none of y'all know who that is except the people that are in the Bible school, but he is phenomenal. He lives in Oklahoma. We, saw, we found out he lived in Oklahoma, so we called to see if we could get him, and I thought, you know, he, he's probably booked up for a year or two. He's coming in March, 
And he's doing the same thing. He's going to do a men's breakfast on Saturday morning. We're going to have a seminar at 10 o'clock on Saturday done by him. He, has, he, has, he calls his ministry the ministry of helps. And that may not sound be impressive to you, but I'm telling you, it's going to be the most impressive teaching you have ever heard. Uh, and then Sunday morning, he's going to come and he's going to preach on the ministry of help. And then we're going to have a special Sunday night service that week where we, uh, he teaches you how to relate to your pastor. See, that's something I can't teach, right? But he could. And so he, he's been to over 3,300 churches in his ministry over the years. And I'm telling you, he's got some incredible insight. And so I'm excited about what God is going to do in us because all these things happen for a reason. Don Babb is not coming by accident. Buddy Bell is not coming by accident. They're coming to input something that God has put in them for the body of Christ today. And we're going to be forever changed. But right now, I want you to concentrate on what you heard this morning. We have got to be transformed. We've got to continue to be transformed from now on. But it starts now. We, we didn't, we, we didn't, we're not going to waste this three weeks of prayer and fasting. We're going to continue what God is doing in our lives going forward. And so whatever the Holy Spirit may have spoke to you this morning, when she starts playing, I want you to just come up to the altar. In fact, just start coming on now. And let's commit everything to God. Whatever area in our life needs to die, let's just purpose to do that. Uh, things that we need to do to walk in the Spirit more, let's cement that with God this morning. And let him have his way in us. Let him change us and make, him, make us more like him. Amen. You come. Watch him put it.
people in the world in which we live and they will lie, steal, and cheat to get money and positions of power and they think they're so smart. I want to tell you something this morning. G pay attention over here. Hey, hey. They think they're so smart. Listen, Jesus is still on the throne. He hasn't given up his power. He hasn't given up his authority. He is still on the throne. And he is going to, before it's over with, I can't tell you how soon, but before it's over with, he's going to make everything right. Yeah. I am looking forward to living in that millennial kingdom yeah. where Jesus rules and reigns from Jerusalem. Amen. Where we go every year and make a report of our territories, whatever he's put us in charge of. Yes. You can't imagine what that's going to be like. <laughs> There'll be no more uh, corruption. There'll be no more, I mean, we're going to be ruled by righteousness. Yes. It's going to be great. It's going to be yes. glorious. Yes. And so when you see all this evil stuff, don't be, don't be bothered by it. Just make a note of it. Jesus has got this. Yes. We have no idea how much power and authority and control Jesus has, but you're going to see it. Amen. You're going to see it. Amen. You're going to see it in America, but you're going to see it throughout the world. Amen. Jesus is coming back. Amen. He's coming back to rule and reign. Yes. Now, you get an amen? Raise your hands toward heaven and receive this from the Lord. May the Lord bless you and keep you and be gracious to you. May he grant to you the peace that passes all understanding. May he draw you closer to himself and prepare.